Sisters in Crime Australia is delighted to welcome you to our 14th Sisters in Crime Law Week event. This year it's called the ABC of DNA. My name is Liz Porter and I'm the author of three books about the way forensic science is used to solve crime. Now before I introduce our esteemed panel, let me please thank the Sir Zelman Cowan Centre at Victoria University, which has partnered with Sisters in Crime for the past five years. Due to the pandemic, we can't hold the event at Victoria University as we usually do. However, thanks to Zoom, anyone, anywhere in the world can now watch this YouTube broadcast. We hope you enjoy it. Many thanks also to the Victoria Law Foundation for its grant for this event. And now, before we begin, um, I would just like to, on behalf of Sisters in Crime, acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And now on to the business of ABC of DNA. Um, as you may gather from my books, I have a special interest in DNA. But with me tonight, I have three extraordinary women, each with special extra insights and information to offer on this most intriguing of subjects. Since we can't all sit at the same table, unfortunately, can't go left to right, so I'll introduce them in alphabetical order. First, we have Anna Davey, who runs the Forensic Foundations Consultancy. Back in the late 80s, she was at the Victoria Police Forensic Science Lab. There, she was part of the first team of police scientists in Australia, and only the fourth in the world, to be doing their own DNA profiling for actual criminal casework. Dr. Dadna Hartman is the Chief Molecular Biologist at the Victorian Institute of Forensic Medicine. This is attached to the coroner's court, and is not to be confused with the police lab, which is out at McLeod near La Trobe University. Um, in 2008, Dr. Hartman led the Institute's disaster victim identification response to the Black Saturday bushfires. Then Julie Sago, who is a freelance writer and columnist for The Age and the author of a book called The Tainted Trial of Farah Jama, which tells the terrible story of the DNA contamination which led a young Somalian refugee to be jailed for a rape that he didn't commit and a rape that never actually happened. Uh, Farah Jama's sentence was eventually overturned but it continues to rank as one of the most serious and worst miscarriages of justice in Victorian legal history. Now we've got a lot of territory to cover tonight so we're going to start at the beginning with Anna Davy who's going to tell us how the DNA era actually began. So firstly, Anna, can you tell us what DNA actually is and how it came to be used in criminal investigation? Thank you, Liz. DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, and it's found in the cells of all living things, and it carries inherited information. That something carried the inherited information was recognised as early as the 1800s, but the exact structure was unknown at that stage. In 1952, Dr Rosalind Franklin was the first person to photograph DNA and identify the helic or coiled structure. In 1953, Drs James Watson and Francis Crick using these photographs, went on to propose the double helix structure that we now identify with DNA. Rosalind Franklin died in 1958, and in 1962, Watson and Crick, together with their colleague, Doc, Dr. Watkins, were awarded the Nobel Prize for their determination of the structure of DNA. In humans, there are 46 DNA molecules in most of our cells. The DNA is really tightly coiled. If it was uncoiled and the 46 molecules laid end to end 
it would stretch almost two meters. The DNA molecule is comprised of four smaller molecules, which we call A, T, G, and C for short. The four molecules act like the letters of the DNA alphabet, spelling out all the information contained in the DNA. The DNA taken from one part of the body is identical to the DNA taken from every other part. We receive half of our DNA from our mother and half of our DNA from our father. Knowing the structure and function of DNA allowed great strides to be made in medicine and in agriculture. But it wasn't until 1985 that it was first used in relation to crime. In 1984, Sir Alex Jeffries, he was Professor Alex Jeffries at the time, developed a method of detecting similarities and differences between individuals by examining specific variations in their DNA. This method was first used in immigration cases to examine family relationships. In 1985, this method was used to identify the perpetrator of the rape and murder of two teenage girls. In addition to the DNA profiling, identifying a man by the name of Colin Pitchfork as the culprit, it exonerated another man who had been the prime suspect, and it also led to the first DNA sweep. On the 1st of July, 1989, Victoria Police commenced offering DNA profiling as a routine service to the criminal justice system in Victoria. As Liz mentioned, this was the first in Australia and the fourth in the world. So, um, Anna, you, back at the Victoria Lab, you were watching what was happening in the UK with great interest. Yes. And back in 1988, uh, there were a couple of cases that Victorian detectives were just dying to use DNA on. Um, can you tell yes. us what uh, you scientists at the lab were able to do for them? Okay, so the very first case uh, that we were involved in working with um, was a case that had actually um, started, or the crimes had started in 1982. And there was a series of uh, rapes, intermittent attacks between 1982 and 1986 in the southern suburbs um, in Melbourne. Um, and the police uh, called this, uh, their operation, Operation Shadow, named because the offender um, at these rapes left very little evidence behind him. By the mid 1980s, the semen samples from the unknown offender were stored for comparison purposes because at that stage we didn't have the technology to compare them. Following some very good police work um, in 1986, a footprint was located at one of the scenes and further inquiries led to the identification of a car used by a man called George Kaufman. Now Kaufman was known to police um, and interestingly, he'd been in jail during the periods of time when no, none of the matching rapes had occurred. In 1988, uh, Kaufman was again uh, in jail, uh, this, for, this time for some burglary offences. As Liz mentioned, we were very interested at that stage in what was happening uh, around the world uh, in, with respect to DNA profiling, particularly the work of Sir Alec Jeffries um, and the work that some uh, companies in America had been uh, undertaking. And we were looking at the different systems to see which one we should implement. When Kaufman was released from jail in 1988, uh, Operation Shadow swung back into action and the stored semen samples were examined using a DNA technology that we had decided to use together with samples from the victims. Um, what we were able to do there was then eliminate the DNA from the victims and the remaining DNA would then be compared with the, su the suspect, um, in this case, Kaufman. However, in 1988, there was no legislation which allowed us to take a sample from a suspect, nor at this stage did the police want to alert him to the fact they were investigating him. However, uh, Kaufman's former wife and his daughter were willing to help. 
Due to the way in which DNA is inherited, it's possible to determine the paternal components of the daughter's profile. And when we did this, we were able to compare them with the semen samples collected from the crime scenes. This was the first case, as I said, taken, undertaken by the Victorian police. And the results were agonizingly slow, as the methodologies we had at the time were very slow. But it was worth the wait, and the results were positive. On the 2nd of December in 1988, Kaufman was charged with 47 counts of rape and burglary. And then he voluntarily provided a blood sample, which then resulted in a full match to the semen samples. In 1989, he then pleaded guilty to all of the charges. That was the first case in Victoria. Yeah, it's a fantastic case and a great uh, tribute to amazing detective work by uh, Stephen Fontana, who was then yes. a reasonably junior detective and is now uh, an assistant commissioner uh, yes. of police, so it's still there. Um, now, Anna, you also worked on another case um, in the early 90s of a serial rapist where the DNA was uh, crucial, uh, not just in catching the man responsible, but before that, in exonerating a bloke who otherwise yeah. may very well That's have right. gone to jail for this case. Yes, yes. So this um, case was known as Operation Century and again related to a series of rapes. Um, it was called Operation Century because in this case, the offender told the victims to count to 100 uh, before moving, which allowed him time to get away. This series of rapes occurred in 1993. DNA wasn't the only tool in the investigation. All the traditional policing and forensic tools were also involved. However, DNA samples were collected from the crime scenes and it demonstrated that there was one offender. At one stage, the police had 177 suspects. We were working long hours at the lab to rapidly turn around the DNA profiles for these suspects. At that stage, it took six weeks to obtain a full DNA profile, but we developed a screening method which allowed us to exclude potential suspects within days. That was unheard of at the time. At one stage, as Liz indicated, the police had a man in custody who they were, well, they believed had committed the offences. The preliminary testing at this stage did not exclude him as the offender. However, so further testing was required. This further testing then excluded him about a week later. It was a very tense week. In June 1993, Police surveillance spotted another man acting suspiciously and they gave chase. The he matched the description of the offender and his clothes also matched. His name was Christopher Clarence Hall. Hall agreed to provide a blood sample which matched all the semen samples from the rape scenes. In October 1993, Hall faced uh, 81 charges, including 25 rape charges and one aggravated rape charge. And in April 2004, oh, sorry, in April 1994, he pleaded guilty for all the charges. Mm. Yeah, it is an extraordinary case. And it is. The, and the guy that was in custody, I, uh, one of your colleagues uh, was saying to me that he is convinced that if this had happened pre-DNA, there's every chance that um, police may have given up at that point and tried this guy and uh, he was a fairly suspicious character and he, but he may have yes. gone to jail for uh, yeah. crimes he did not commit. I think it's highly likely. Yeah. Mm. Um, so in, back in those days, um, I know you worked around yes. the clock um, eliminating yes. suspects uh, and it all took weeks. And not only that, but you needed a 20 cent sized yes. blood stain or a five mm. cent sized semen stain to get a profile. Yes. How have things changed over the intervening three decades for scientists? Oh, it's massive. There is, there's no correlation between what we did then and what is happening now. Um, as well as having to have large samples to start with, we were only looking at five areas of DNA. Um, and the test took, as I indicated before, six weeks to get a full result, which was a, a long time. Um, Things slowly evolved. By the mid-1990s, we'd actually introduced a new technique called polymerase chain reaction, which is 
uh, the technique that's used these days. It's known as PCR for short. And it not only allowed us to examine much smaller uh, amounts of biological material, but it also increased the number of areas of DNA we were able to look at. It didn't speed up the process that much because we still had to look at each area of DNA separately. However, the tests that they use now are streets ahead of the tests that we had in those days. Uh, we've got to the stage where we can get DNA profiles from samples we can't even see with the naked eye. We routinely look at 24 or even more areas of DNA and they are done very efficiently. In the old days, everything had to be done manually. These days, we have instruments that allow us to examine multiple samples at once and that really speeds up the process. So it's a whole new world when we're comparing, comparing it to the early days of DNA. Uh, the other thing that has allowed us to do is because we're looking at more areas of DNA, not only do we, are we able to compare uh, direct matches, so a blood sample with a semen sample, but we're also allowed to look at familial matches, look at, at partial profiles. And I think Dadna is going to talk more about using um, the uh, familial side of DNA uh, testing. Edna? Yes. So in addition to the sort of analysis that Adna described, which is known as STR typing or profiling, um, we can also uh, use that same technique to target the male-specific DNA. So this is particularly important for um, crimes that involve, for example, sexual assault, where you might be looking to target uh, DNA from a male offender amongst a sea of DNA that belongs to the victim, who are usually female. So you're trying to pinpoint that minute amount of male DNA. So we can target that by doing what is known as YSTR profile that looks specifically at the DNA that's on the Y chromosome. So that's really been an advancement um, that's really useful uh, today for criminal investigations. And the other type of analysis um, that we do routinely now is known as mitochondrial DNA analysis. Now, we have actually two types of DNA in us. We have nuclear DNA, which is the, the type that we're most familiar with and we hear routinely on crime shows and on television. Uh, but there's also mitochondrial DNA. And we can look at this mitochondrial DNA and it's really useful when we've got degraded samples. So in cases where we may not be able to recover nuclear DNA for the conventional STR profile, we can do mitochondrial DNA typing. Now, it's not as um, informative as nuclear DNA, but it's really useful when actually we can't get our hands on any nuclear DNA. So when we have old bones or hairs or things that um, have very little nuclear DNA, uh, we can use this sort of analysis. And there's also um, the speed with which it's done. I guess there's um, uh, a technique called rapid DNA, Dadna. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so essentially it's the same, pro the same process that we're doing in the lab, which may, we may be able to do in a day or sometimes less time than that if we need to push a sample through quickly. It's uh, boiling down all that process into one reaction that can happen in a, a desktop type of instrument and that can be done in 90 minutes so you could imagine that by having these sort of bench top instruments that can look at at the moment um, they work well with pristine DNA samples so uh, mouth swabs or things that have a lot of DNA work well these types of instruments but we're also looking at them to see whether we can use them from a point of view of putting more compromised samples so for us, because we're interested in identification of deceased persons, we could see the utility of these sorts of instruments during our disaster victim identification scenario where we are in a remote location, for example, where we could fast track DNA analysis using these instruments. Mm -hmm. So it is extraordinary. But there are still um, limitations to what DNA profiling can do for an investigation. So, Anna. What are they? Well, there's a number of limitations. Um, for every scientific technique, there are positives and there are negatives. 
Um, one of the positives with the current system, as I mentioned before, is the sensitivity. We can actually uh, examine samples that we can't, biological samples that we can't actually see with the naked eye. Um, however, this sensitivity also leads us to problems. So everybody leaves DNA wherever they've been. Um, the, these traces of DNA that we leave can also be transferred from one place to another. And so it's really important to be able to um, interpret the DNA that we're finding. We can find DNA that might be in a location that's not related to the crime that actually was committed in that particular location. Makes the interpretation of DNA profiles extremely complex. And this complexity needs to be recognized by the end users, by the police and by the courts. We also can't age the deposits of DNA. So if we get a DNA profile, we might be able to say that this DNA profile matches a particular individual, but we can't say when that DNA was actually deposited at the scene. And it could well have been deposited many week, days, weeks, months uh, before any particular incident might have taken place. Uh -huh. We need to be very careful with the interpretation of DNA results. Uh -huh. So, um, now of course, DNA has, as we've seen, utterly transformed the work of detectives um, in criminal investigations, but it, it has also revolutionised um, missing persons investigations, as well as the investigations that follow disasters such as tsunamis and bushfires. Now, uh, Dadna, um, you don't use DNA to solve crimes at the Victorian Institute of Forensic Medicine, but you do solve a lot of mysteries. Um, can you tell us a bit more about your work? So we are um, specifically tasked with assisting the coroners in the identification of deceased persons. Now, often when someone is reported to the coroner's court, they can be visually identified by loved ones and their identity can be confirmed that way but there are quite a number of cases where that's not possible and we need to use scientific means of identification. Now that could be dental records, fingerprints or DNA. So that's where we come into picture, where our lab will compare the DNA profile from a deceased person that perhaps has been involved in some sort of trauma, um, accident, uh, fire, and we will take that profile and compare that to a sample that's been provided by the family member. And we ask the question, are these two individuals biologically related? So we can um, then ascertain the identification of those individuals. Now, we try to do that in a very timely manner so that families can have their loved ones back um, quickly. So our aim is to have those uh, processes done in as fast a time as possible for families. Um, but as you can imagine, during something like a disaster, like we had in the 2009 Victorian bushfires, where we had all of a sudden a year's um, worth of casework in three months, that, that takes a lot of time and effort, and a lot of people had to work very um, hard to be able to identify those individuals. And we were just one part of the puzzle. So if anything, I would like our listeners to take away is that DNA is just one small of the forensic puzzle. We provide a part of that picture, but that has to be taken together in the context of what does the post-mortem examination tell us, what does the odontology, anthropology, and all those other forensic disciplines to bring a holistic picture about these cases. So DNA is not everything for a particular case, but it can certainly assist. Um, so most of our work is around identification, um, as you mentioned, we work closely with our colleagues, not only at Victoria Police, but in other jurisdictions to help with long-term missing person investigations, particularly because we can offer mitochondrial DNA testing that other jurisdictions don't use. So we've been able to assist, for example, in um, the identification of long-term cases like the Daniel Morkham identification and other cases where um, mitochondrial DNA has played a crucial part in those um, investigations. Mm -hmm. So um, Dadna, um, there are also other things that DNA can tell us. Um, you were talking about um, you know, matching um, uh, DNA samples to try and identify missing persons, but there are other mysteries that DNA can unlock. Can you tell us about those? So with the conventional type of testing that we can currently do, 
we are limited in that we need a reference sample, something to compare it to. If we don't have them, then our investigation essentially comes to a halt. But with new techniques, um, such as next generation sequencing, or also known as massively parallel sequencing, we can now look at thousands of DNA markers that can also tell us additional things about the donor, how they may have looked like, their hair colour, eye colour, their ancestry. So we can start to build a picture of the donor from their DNA and then say, um, for these unidentified remains that fit this particular uh, picture, let's say we're looking at someone with blonde hair, blue eyes, of European ancestry, we can start looking at missing person records to say, what of those records fit those descriptors and try to narrow down the list of potential candidates that we can then apply our traditional DNA profiling. So we're very excited about the usefulness of these sort of techniques that are coming up that will be able to provide us leads that we can follow based on the DNA. Uh -huh. So it sounds incredibly futuristic, the idea of being able to look at a DNA sample and say, hmm, redhead, um, tall, maybe, brown eyes. Um, I gather that um, in the USA, uh, there are companies which are selling that kind of profiling to police forces. Um, can you tell us any cases where that has been used? Yes. So. Um most of the cases that I'm familiar with are things that have happened in the US. Um, for me, one particular case that has struck in my mind, and it was a case that occurred in 2008 where a young woman was brutally assaulted in a home, left to die, essentially. The perpetrator of the crime um, escaped through a window and left some blood behind. Um, and through our sort of conventional analysis or policing um, they went through list after list of potential um, persons of interest and essentially ticking them off and coming to dead ends. And it wasn't until almost 10 years later that the investigator said, well, let's try some of these new DNA analysis techniques, uh, looking at phenotypic and ancestry markers. And using that information, they were able to build the profile of their person of interest. And in this case, it was someone who had a sort of European background, a fair complexion, a particular you know, hair and eye colour. And with that information, they were able to go back to their list of uh, persons of interest and say, okay, any of these all of a sudden look interesting to us and, you know, they go to the top of the list. And it was then through policing work that they were able to get a profile and match it back to the crime and identify this person. So these sorts of testing can give you leads. They won't necessarily identify the person, but they'll be able to assist you in hopefully narrowing down a list of people that you can then go and do your standard investigative and then analysis work. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. Now, Julie Sago. Julie, um, you know a great deal about a case uh, uh, which is not one of DNA's great successes. Mm. It's a case where... Um, police and lawyers' faith in DNA results became associated with one of the worst miscarriages in uh, recent, miscarriages of justice in recent memory. Um, can you tell us what happened and what went wrong? Yeah, sure. And, uh, and it's pretty tragic, as we know, in America, the Innocence Project has uh, exonerated so many black men who've been wrongly convicted. Um, and here is this case in Australia where it's DNA, arguably, that um, put a black man wrongly in jail. Um, I'll tell... All right, well, look, this, this story kind of starts in, um, let's say, November 2016. It concerns Farah Jama, who is, um, at the time, 19 years old. He is of Somali background. His family fled very brutal civil war in Somalia. They spent seven years in a refugee camp. They came to Australia via New Zealand. He was, um, I think it was the morning of uh, his VCE exams and all of a sudden doorbell rings and there are three detectives on the doorstep and they say, um, Farah Jama, he says yes, they say, uh, would you please come with us to the station? Um, he lives in Preston with his family um, and they say, we want to question you in relation to the alleged rape of a woman. And as they're 
driving him to the station, to Doncaster Station. Um, they drive past a nightclub, an over 28s nightclub, and they say to him, um, you see that place over there? That's where the, the rape is alleged to have taken place. And he said, I've, I've never been in that place. He said, I've never even been in this suburb. You know, they take him down to the station. Um, they show him a photograph of the uh, alleged victim, who is a woman in her late 40s. And he says, I've never seen this woman. You know, and they say, well, you know, we're alleging that you had sex with this woman against her will. And he said, listen, he said, I'm a virgin. I haven't even ever had sex. You know, um, the police had absolutely no evidence linking him to the nightclub um, on the night of the alleged rape. There were no um, fingerprints. There were no traffic records that suggested he was in the area. There was no telephone records that suggested he was in the area. There were security cameras at the venue. And remember, this is um, an over 28s nightclub. And those cameras were on for most of the night. His image was not captured on any of the security cameras. Um, there's evidence that there was between about 600 to 800 patrons in the nightclub on that night and not one, the police could not find one witness who remembered seeing a young, you know, 19-year-old uh, man of African appearance at the nightclub on that night. All the police had was DNA. And on the basis of that one piece of evidence, Farah Jama was charged with rape. He was put on trial. Um, he was convicted and he served 16 months of his sentence before his innocence was established. And as you say, the Court of Appeal um, overturned the conviction. So in terms of what happened, um, I'll give you the spoilers. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's, it's quite an extraordinary sort of set of circumstances. Um, we will start on the night before. So this is the night before um, this alleged nightclub rape. It's uh, July 2016. And Farah Jama and two of his friends, also of Somali background, uh, go to a pool hall in Reservoir. And while they're there, they, ha they hook up with a young woman, also 19 years old, and the three of them, the four of them, sorry, go off together in a car. Um, and certain sex acts take place in that car. And afterwards, the young woman is very upset and she goes to the police and she alleges that uh, the three men coerced her into having oral sex. Um, the police say, well, you know, would you like to have a rape examination? And she says, yes. And she goes to a particular room in the Austin Hospital, the emergency department of the hospital, which is where these, kind, these forensic samples are taken and where rape examinations take place. Um, and they, at the time when she walks in there, she has uh, dried semen in her hair and that semen is shedding, okay? Um, and, you know, that uh, a, a, a chunk of that sort of, uh, of her hair that's matted with the semen is snipped and bagged and we'll cut that scene. Okay. At 20, around 24 hours later, the middle-aged alleged rape victim, so she's in her late 40s, she goes to, she goes to the over 28s nightclub in Doncaster um, she's on various uh, medication. Um, she has quite a bit to drink. Um, she remembers talking, her last memory is talking to one, a guy who seemed a little bit sleazy. Um, next thing she knows, she's kind of passed out. Um, her, the top button of her jeans is undone and her zip is down. And she doesn't remember what happened to her and she's taken to the hospital and uh, she worries the next day that perhaps somebody spiked her drink because she doesn't she's never had a reaction like that before she says they say to her well do you want to do a um a rape exam she says oh maybe maybe i will um and she uh goes to the austin hospital 
she goes to the room in the emergency department of the Austin Hospital, the same room where the young woman was uh, taken 24 hours before, the same doctor attends to her, and uh, this whole time, this is, this is what we think happened. Um, there was uh, a box of slides that was open in the room and when the various swabs were taken from her vagina, um, you know, that's, that, that was kind of swabbed on the slide and that slide had a flake of semen from the young girl's uh, hair from the night before that had contaminated the equipment. Um, now, after the incident with the young girl, Farah Jama was interviewed by the police. Um, he said that the, uh, that the encounter was uh, consensual. He admitted to it, but he said, you know, it was consensual. And the police said, well, will you give us a DNA sample anyway? It's, it's a matter of routine. He agreed to that. Um, the, afterwards, the young woman um, from the pool hall, she did not proceed with her complaint. She was persuaded that for various reasons it wouldn't get up in court. Um, but under Victorian law, the, Victor the police could hang on to Farah Jama's uh, DNA profile um, on the database, even if he hadn't been charged with an offence for a period of about a year. So when the nightclub woman's um, uh, samples were run through the police database, it came up a perfect match to Farah Jama. Um, that's, uh, that's the kind of uh, best hypothesis, hypothesis about uh, what happened um, after, um, after Farah Jama was exonerated and there was a, uh, Frank Vincent QC did a report of an inquiry into the likely circumstances of the miscarriage of justice. Now, I gather there were lessons learned from this experience and number one was it's not a good idea to uh, uh, rest a, a case wholly on a DNA result. I mean, it was, I think, a deeply flawed uh, uh, police investigation as well. Um, but I think the case also suggested, uh, Julie, that uh, law doesn't exist in a social uh, vacuum and that, um, uh, you know, while DNA took the rap for this, um, there's also uh, a very strong suggestion that um, uh, a case like this wouldn't have happened to a Anglo uh, private schoolboy from Brighton. What do you think? Um, I would even drop the, the private school bit. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think that this would... Uh, look, we can't be sure, can we? And hindsight is a wonderful thing. Um, I... I don't, I don't think that, I think even just any regular Anglo boy might not find himself in this position. Um, and I suppose that's just, again, um, my, my view about it, but where I guess it just wasn't, I don't think it was a coincidence that it happened um, to this particular guy. I mean, um, Frank Vincent, when he looked at the case, he said, look, We've had, we've had DNA bungles before, we've had kind of contaminated samples, but it's been discovered at a certain point in, in proceedings. It has never gone this far. He said that what was highly unusual about this case was that it went right through to the keeper from mm -hmm. investigation through to conviction all the way to, to the Court of Appeal. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that there are complex reasons for this. I think it had a lot to do with who... Farah Jama was. Um, he was of a refugee background. He was of a very devout Muslim background. Um, there was a lot of noise around at the time about, you know, Muslim integration, about um, issues to do with women, um, misogyny and so on. Um, and also uh, Farah Jama himself, um, in defending himself, I think, had to step around a lot of taboos in his mm, culture. Mm, yeah. you know, I'm afraid we're going horribly over time. <laughs> um, um, and we're now having uh, listened to the story of some DNA in real cases. Um, we need to turn our um, attention to uh, the world of television where, of course, uh, criminal investigation and the issues of DNA are so much simpler. Now, um, everyone here I know watches some kind of a crime or forensic show, 
we've all got our favourites. Uh, for me, it's Silent Witness. Um, Jadna, what's yours? I kind of like the sort of Netflix um, Mindhunter or the Unabomber type mini series where I can binge watch for mm. a little while yeah. and get really immersed into mm. the story. So I really like those. And uh, Anna? Um, I have to say that I like the old NCIS programs when Abby Shuto was the forensic scientist. Mm -hmm. yes. And ex acceptably eccentric, of course. And okay. Julie? <laughs> and Julie, for oh. you? Oh, dear. Uh, look, I can't. I'm not sure about forensics, I suppose, but I like anything Nordic mm. noir, uh, really. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, so, Dad, now I gather your work uh, is a little bit different from what you see on television. What are the main differences? Oh, look, it's, we always kind of have a bit of a giggle when we see things that are, you know, solved within a, a window of 24 hours of, or they like, um, put up a huge image of a person that they've been able to profile from a particular piece of information. So mm. it's kind of that jump. But sometimes we are amazed at that, you know, at things that we might see on television in a few years' time. We go, hey, well, that wasn't that far-fetched. Mm -hmm. And mm. Anna? Well, I like Abby for the simple reason that she can do um, DNA, toxicology, <laughs> fingerprints, document examination, computer mm. forensics, you name it, she can do it. One person. Now, if we could just clone her, then we would be have no problems, no backlogs. Everything would be, you know, much better than it is at the moment. But unfortunately, to do what she does takes an awful lot of people and a lot of expertise. And Julie, is there anything that makes you want to throw a cushion at the television screen when you're watching? <laughs> Uh, no, I just love watching uh, procedural crime shows and um, yeah. the brain switches off and kind oh, of yeah. the, part of the experience takes, takes over. <laughs> <Yeah>. okay. <laughs> okay, so now we have a bit of uh, Sisters in Crime business to attend to. Um, uh, we've got to choose three lucky ticket holders mm -hmm. to score packs of crime novels worth $150, um, including books uh, by Julie Sago and by me. Um, and I would need each panellist to pick a number between 1 and 31. So, um, Anna? Lucky 13. Okay, that would uh, be Claire Farley, who will be contacted later. Um, and uh, Dadna? 11. 11, that would be um, Megan Shane um, and Julie. 16. 16. Uh, that would be Lauren Skinner. Um, you can buy The Tainted Trial of Farah Jama from Wild Dingo Press. That is if you weren't lucky enough to win one tonight. And you can buy my book, Crime Scene Asia, from Booktopia. Um, also, catch up with Sisters in Crime, Murder Mondays, um, interviews with Australian and international authors about the craft of crime writing. They can be found every Monday at 6 p.m., um, and there are also monthly events on YouTube. Uh, keep in touch with Sisters in Crime through our website, www.citizencrime.org.au. Sign up for our e-newsletter, A Stab in the Dark, or better still, just join. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. And thank you everyone for your attention tonight and uh, stay strong and stay safe. Okay. Thank you. Bye.